EBIS Solutions is part of the EBIS Group, which has been successfully operating in the Southeast European market for over 25 years. With more than 100 skilled employees, 50 satisfied clients, a portfolio of superior solutions from leading software vendors, and companies and offices in five countries, EBIS Solutions has become one of the major system integration and software development companies in the region. EBIS Solutions helps companies in telecommunication, finance, enterprise, and government sectors to reinvent their businesses for the challenges of the digital age by offering an integrated portfolio of products, solutions, services in the area of digital, hybrid cloud, integration, automation, advanced analytics, and cybersecurity. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, to our next keynote. Uh, our next keynote speaker is Kay Firth Butterfield, head of AI and machine learning and member of the executive uh, committee of the World Economic uh, Forum. She is also a barrister and former judge, master of the Inner Temple of London, and serves on the Lord Chief Justice advisory panel on AI and law. This is just the tip of the iceberg for Kay and her body of work, and I don't want to take too much time from her amazing talk, which is called Intersection of International Relations and AI. Unfortunately, Kay couldn't join us live here today at Belgrade, so she will be joining us virtually. Please give her a well, well, warm welcome. And uh, hi, Kay. Hi, Can you hear us? thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and giving us your talk. Your expertise is very much appreciated and I hope uh, you can share with our attendees some worthwhile knowledge and information. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, I think I'm going to speak for about 30, 35 minutes and then take questions. So please stock up those questions because it's the questions that make a talk useful to you, I think. Yeah. So um, I am going to start by saying that uh, having me speak to you for such a long time is probably cruel and unusual punishment. And so what I like to do when I do these long talks is really to um, pepper them with stories and um, vignettes so that you can actually understand what I'm saying. So the title, The Intersection of AI and International Relations, it's actually such an important topic, um, and yet nobody's really thinking about it and talking, or if they're thinking about it, they're not talking about it very much. So today what I wanted to do was talk you through um, what is international relations? Why does it matter in the AI space? And then move on to the various governance regimes um, for business and government and what I think the future looks like. So let's start with international relations. Um, what we have seen in the past is effectively a competition between some of the big powers so China, Europe, uh, United States, and some of the big influential powers uh, like India, uh, really trying to influence the rest of the world into their thinking about geo the geopolitical space. And what we see is sort of three approaches. So the United States has always used the, the carrot and stick approach where um, they will give aid, but only to countries that are uh, adopting a human rights approach. Um, and then we have China, um, which in the past has always approached, we give you something um, in, uh, in exchange for you giving us something back. And so um, that might be business acumen. And in this case, it's artificial intelligence. And then you have the EU, which sort of takes a human rights approach too, um, but is not such a um, huge player in the AI space at the moment. 
And so what we've got developing in the AI space is what Kai Fu Lee said was an AI superpower race. Um, whether that's true, we could debate at length, but I am seeing this through the lens of international relations. So who, whose approach and style of, of working with AI and that, and we'll particularly talk about this when we come to the regulatory piece, is actually going to um, influence the rest of the world. And I think that that's really important because when we're thinking about what the future with artificial intelligence looks like for us as human beings, then the regulatory system that is adopted by your country is actually going to be fairly important to you. So what we see in artificial intelligence is three big regulatory systems uh, um, developing. The first out of the EU with the forthcoming EU AI Act. And I particularly think that we are going to see from the AI uh, from the EU AI Act, a similar trickle down across um, various regions of the world, that act as we did see for GDPR. So I think that that's one piece of um, international relations uh, where, uh, and around AI, where actually the EU is going to be playing a bigger role perhaps than its actual ability to create the technology. Then we're seeing the United States, um, and the United States is just starting outreach. Um, so the Department of State has just opened a new department to um, uh, use this approach where um, they, they want to um, uh, allow the technology to um, spread, but using that human rights based approach that I talked about earlier. And um, also, of course, there isn't really a regulatory system at all uh, going on in America. It's very fragmented. And so how that's pushed out, we will wait, we'll have to wait and see. And then in China, we are seeing a regulatory approach um, being developed where it's more about um, the interaction between the company and the customer rather than the interaction between the citizen and the state. And then because the World Economic Forum now has 16 offices thinking about artificial intelligence around the world, I could just talk about, for example, India, um, where uh, we were involved in, in helping them think about responsible artificial intelligence, and there may be legislation coming up, and, uh, and Japan as well, where there, there will be um, an approach of regulatory a regulatory approach. Um, I'd also just like to mention Singapore, because Singapore, um, we did a, some work with them on a model governance of AI scheme. And that is really interesting because um, Singapore has now introduced a sort of certification around that uh, model governance scheme. So if you're working in AI, you, you may need to be certified if you're working in Singapore. So. As you can see, just from those few things that I've mentioned, we are seeing very different approaches. And the one that actually rolls out to more of the world, or if it's two, or maybe even three, it really depends um, on the depth and breadth of, um, of pickup on the, of those governance um, regimes as to what artificial intelligence will look like in the future and the scope of actually being able to use artificial intelligence in the future. So although many of you will be making the technology and coming up with bright ideas, 
I really think it's important that you keep an eye on this because these are your markets um, and you want to know what your market is likely to look like five years and 10 years hence. So let me tell you a story about human, the human rights approach. So back in 2021, Michelle Bachelet, who was at that stage the head of the United Nations Human Rights Commission, said that um, there should be a moratorium on using AI um, big, until we sort out the problems of artificial intelligence. Obviously, that didn't happen. And um, we are now plowing on um, with the different, um, the different governance regimes and the technology itself being used so widely, as we all know, everywhere. But um, what we are actually seeing in the United States is uh, the use of law, existing law, to actually um, put parameters around the use of technology. So let me give you an example. Um, we know that uh, both the EU and um, the US have felt that the use of AI in human resources can be a very dangerous thing. Well, in uh, the United States, there is no law apart from in New York about uh, that particular usage. And so um, the Equal, um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which I always have to pause and think about, um, one of their commissioners has said, well, we have existing law that deals with discrimination in human resources, and it's called the Civil Rights Act of 1965. And so we will simply apply that to um, the use or misuse of AI in this particular field. And so you can see uh, across America, court cases beginning to develop around these particular topics. Now, you might say, okay, well, you know, we've been in court before and that might be a good way of um, moving forward, but actually it's not necessarily a good way of moving forward. It, it might be the only way at the moment, but what you're going to find is very fragmented approaches across the whole of the United States and anywhere else that this approach to regulation takes place. Um, also, judges, and in some cases in America, juries are not necessarily very technically able. And so we might again see some patchy decision making here. But the premise that the EEOC is starting with is that they will sue the person who used the technology. And I can bet, I would bet you a great deal of money that the person who uses the technology, who is essentially for you, the buyer of your technology is going to come after you if they're hit with a lawsuit. And so it's, it's, it makes it hard for you doing business internationally, where there are all these different fragmented approaches. Additionally, um, when we're thinking about a human rights approach, although the EU and the um, US have the same human rights um, vision, they actually apply the thinking uh, on human rights very differently. So what are we actually seeing in terms of international governance of AI? Are you going to get any help to be able to understand this, this complex um, system that's coming at you from the United Nations? Well, yes, you're going to get something out of the OECD and the UNESCO and UNICEF, but um, none of that is binding and um, none of that is going, that, that would be international law and it's not really going to be applicable to you until it's trickled down into national law. So 
we have this 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 problem in um, AI and uh, international relations at the moment, where we are scattered across the world with no one system. So that means if you're a multinational um, company and you care about your brand value in terms of the use of AI responsibly, you are going to have to, you are going to be met by a number of different regulatory systems. And as I said, and I'm going to keep saying, that is going to change the trajectory of people's lives as the different systems are adopted across the world. So um, let me very quickly tell you about the uh, Bill of Rights, the AI Bill of Rights, which we um, had in America about a month ago. This is again, a non-enforceable system. Uh, it came out of the White House OSTP and um, it's, it, it's sort of, big picture thinking um, and so it talks about citizens right to have safe and effective systems to have algorithmic discrimination protections data privacy notice and explainability and you should be able to opt out easily from things that you don't want to be actually using um, they are all fabulous and laudable things <laughs> that we should um, be talking about and doing, but um, will America actually legislate on any of this? We have just had elections here and um, we are still waiting for the result of one of them in Georgia, one of the state Senate races in Georgia. It, I personally think it's very unlikely that America will get round to um, having to legislating, having law around artificial intelligence and its, the use of it. So that again throws us back onto what the EU is doing um, or what China's doing if you're a country that wants to follow a particular reg regulatory regime. So um, I wanted to also talk when I'm thinking about um, AI and the UN about lethal autonomous weapons. As you probably know, there have, have been discussions in the United Nations to ban lethal autonomous weapons for the last now, I think, five years. And we are going nowhere with that. And so if we think of that as part of the global regulatory system, we um, are, it's not a route that seems to be working for us. And um, it seems that everybody um, doesn't want to give up their opportunity to use lethal autonomous weapons, regardless of where they exist in the country. So although we have 192 plus um, uh, ethical principles around artificial intelligence, we do not have any holistic approach to regulation on AI. So I wanted to talk very quickly now about what we are seeing in terms of the now of AI. So what so my story here is the um, recent Edelman study on, a, on trust in AI. What we are seeing in the global north is a gradual decrease by citizens, not only in their governments, but also in technology and the use of AI in particular. The South is less worried about the use of artificial intelligence, um, but, and so obviously that's potentially new markets, and that is where I come back to this global governance regime and whether it's a market that will be open to you. Um, and so um, what we will see, I think, in the global south is 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 for is that some of the larger countries will get on board with regulation um, around artificial intelligence, and I'm going to tell you a story in a moment about that. Um, but 
the others you might find more open less regulated markets um and obviously the um in interest i think here is you know what happens for gpt3 working with ai dali job skills what do we do about regulation in space of the use of ai large amount language models etc so ai is everywhere but global governance is is not everywhere it's more of a serpentine path for you to navigate um so i just wanted to tell you a story about uh governance in the global south so we worked with our office in um brazil to think about how do governance governments um influence the way that ai is developed in their countries and i personally although i'm a lawyer i like in this space what we call soft governance um and so what we did with brazil and what we and what we had started with the united kingdom is um develop a set of guidelines and a workbook for um those who procure ai on behalf of the government to actually um it have a set of metrics for procuring um ethical or responsible ai now the reason that this is important is that it allows the government without actually um regulating to influence the way that ai is used in their country because governments have so much money and they are putting money into ai that they're able to sort of say this is my threshold for tolerance of ai or this is where i want responsible ai to be in my country and so it's an influence rather than actual regulation i think that soft law means that you can um adapt more easily as we begin to see all these other things that i just mentioned so um let's talk about why uh what other forms of governance we are seeing um we're seeing uh as i said soft law i like soft law uh we are seeing regulators and as i said earlier we're seeing what the eeoc is thinking in terms of the way that they can um use the existing law we have um standards and uh i worked with the ieee to create the standards on artificial intelligence we're seeing those spread out um through iso as well as the ieee and um the eu if you don't know is going to use a a set of standards for actual enforcement of the new act and then there's there's the legislation and obviously that's like the legislation we're going to see in europe um so i wanted to take us back a little way to think about uh what was the responsible ai history and um why are we all talking about responsible ai and governance of ai in the first place because this is an interesting movement it, geopolitically um because um it's been very short i mean in ai terms it's probably been quite quite long but um we started thinking about responsible ai seriously back in 2014 um that's when deep mind sold itself to uh google and insisted on having an ethics advisory panel um and then of course we had um in may uh 2014 uh, uh stephen hawking and stuart russell and max tegmark write in the times of london that um ai could be the best thing that we humans do or it could be the last thing that we do and uh that year also we saw super intelligence written by nick bostrom um the ieee work started in so 
December of 2015. And um, I actually became the world's first chief AI ethics officer. I wish I hadn't called myself that now, but we've learnt as time goes by. Um, and uh, that was in 2014 too. Um, many of us working in the field, and I suppose there might only have been a hundred of us at that stage, went to Azilamar to set up those first ethical principles. But this has really been the birth of a movement, and we are now seeing responsible AI everywhere. And uh, nobody wants to be the company that does irresponsible AI. So um, I have been at the forum since 2017 working on this exclusively, although now we think about applications of AI and particularly in the climate space as well. Um, and we see a proliferation of um, international bodies like GPA, um, the OECD and UNESCO. But as I explained earlier, they don't have teeth. They are not a legal system. They're, they're an advisory system um, that countries can adopt if they want to. So why responsible AI? Well, first of all, because as I just said, you don't want to be the company that's considered to be irresponsible. If you're the company that's considered to be irresponsible, you're going to lose customers and brand value, and that's not going to be good for your company. So it's as simple as that. But it's also about thinking about the sort of world that you individually want to live in with the tools that you're creating. So I've got a little story here. I sit on the board of a fabulous little nonprofit using AI to determine what whales say to one another. So what we're trying to do is work out whale language so that we can speak to the whales and they can speak to us. Now that might no, that's obviously that wonderful Dr. Doolittle moment, and I'm sure that everybody's wanted to know what their pet would like to say to them or something like that. Um, I fear that my dogs probably only want to say, when is it dinner time to me? But the importance of finding out what whales are talking about could be that we can save their lives and we can ask them to dive at the time when a ship's coming and might otherwise kill them. The question then is, is that ethical? Should, why should we say that we are the dominant species? Why shouldn't the boat, get, the ship get out of the way? So even when you are using AI for the best possible reasons, it throws up some of these issues. Um, and so, what, we, what we're seeing is that although the world has agreed uh, on those 192 principles, only, I suppose, nine of them are actually agreed by everybody across the world. So we know that um, everybody is concerned about bias, fairness, security, robustness, and reliability privacy, explainability and transparency, giving people human agency with, with regard to AI, accountability and the lawfulness of the, um, of the algorithm. But what we don't agree on, as I've said previously, is how we get to this point of, um, we all agree on this, but we don't know how to show that we all agree together on it. So I think that um, the uh, uh, another little sort of story will help to illustrate some of the problems that we are seeing in, in the United States of having what is frankly a fragmented approach. So the place that you would go if you wanted to know what was happening in regulation um, around AI or legislation around AI would not be the federal government. You would actually go to the governor's website. 
because we are seeing um, states begin to um, legislate on pieces of artificial intelligence. And that's, um, as I say, New York on um, on uh, the use of AI in hiring or California on privacy. Um, but smaller states are also legislating. And why does why do I say that what we're doing at the moment is working out the the future that we want for ourselves? And I, I think I can illustrate this with a small story. The bulk of the American people do not want bans on abortion. However, there are a number of states that have banned abortion in some cases, in all cases. Um, and so what we're seeing is the use of algorithms in um seeing license plates, watching for license plates. And um, that joins up with other pieces of technology that we have created that can lead to surveillance. And what we're now seeing in America is um, police forces using all these joined up pieces to work out whether a woman is going for an abortion or has had an abortion. In some cases, you can be arrested for that. The provider can also be arrested for that. And if we um, have a problem with security, the bounty hunters in some of the abortion acts can also access this information. And by bounty hunter, I mean that some of these acts actually um, rely upon the public to um, tell um, on a woman who's had or is about to have an abortion and they get a reward for doing so. So um, facial recognition technology, uh, again, we don't have anything um, globally and yet we probably should to protect our privacy. Excuse me, I just have to have a quick sip. So because of that, we released on the 3rd of November a piece of work that we had done globally with Interpol, the UN and police forces around the world to actually think about if police forces are going to use artificial intelligence, um, how should they do so fairly and appropriately? And so that um, piece of work has now come into force with Interpol and it's in force in all the 196 countries that Interpol serves. It's really important because as I say, we need some of this global approach to the most important areas of, of potential problems with the use of artificial intelligence. So as I said, um, the frag the US approach is very fragmented and I wanted to talk uh, I wanted to tell a little story about how we probably need more than one approach to thinking about responsible AI so a camera uh, sorry a, a facial recognition system that's widely used in in the United States recently passed the NIST um, accountability uh, test with a 95% accuracy in the algorithm. That means that it's probably a great algorithm to use. Um, the question, though, is not whether it can pass a particular standard, and that's the problem of just using one regulatory framework, because actually um, there are some social imperatives in there. Should they be used? Um, should they be used in the way that they're being used? So the the what we're beginning to see is, okay, the algorithm may be great, but we still might not want to be using it um, as a society. And so I want to move from that to tell you a little bit about um, to extend those two problematic scenarios that I've talked about with the AI, one, the abortion, where, you know, we're, we're using AI to enforce the law, but the law doesn't have popular consent. 
and secondly um the the story that i that i just told you um so i want to move on to children and um these special cases where we have very vulnerable people who are using tools that could be used to manipulate them in some way. Um, likewise, older adults, I know with, uh, with any luck that I am going to be cared for when I'm old by AI enabled robots. And um, I'm cool with that, provided somebody has thought about the governance regime that is going to apply to those robots. If I can't give consent, what happens there? Um, and uh, maybe I do in my old age want to be coaxed to eating the right food or taking my pills on time. I certainly want that. Um, but uh, I there, there may be circumstances that I shouldn't be using AI or that AI would be problematic. So these are the sort of store, these are the sort of cases, they're the edge cases of how we think about responsible AI. And I would encourage you as you are coming up to um, Christmas, to think very carefully about buying your child a, an AI enabled toy Make sure you read what's on the box. Make sure you know where your child's data is going, um, whether it can be sold to third parties, and um, what is the child actually getting out of a doll or a, uh, I don't know, a, a uh, toy that uses facial recognition and stores data and um, transports data and what is the educational benefit? Does it say on the packet what they're going to learn from this? Um, or is it a, effectively a surveillance tool that you're bringing into your home? So you really need to think these through. The Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights in the UN has actually thought it through for persons with disabilities. If you are creating tools that help um, persons with disabilities. So I just want to come back to a story and I know that I'm beginning to run out of my time um, on um, soft regulation. In Rwanda, there is one doctor for every 27,000 people. It would not be a good idea for us to um, uh, it would not be a good idea for us to legislate around um, AI use in healthcare because it'll take a long time. Whereas creating some soft law about how you use chatbots to triage so that that one doctor gets to see the people who are needed, he needs, he or she needs to see. Um, that's what's important. So that's again taking you back to soft law. I think I'd probably better stop there and take questions because I realize that I am running out of my time. Hi, hello, Kay. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Uh, okay, great. Um, we do have some questions here, uh, but I would like to to see if anyone in the audience maybe has something they want to say. We have volunteers here with uh, with microphones that can go around and uh, pass you the microphone. Okay, for now, no questions, but I'm going to start here. Um, you did mention a very interesting fact about lethal autonomous weapons and mm -hmm. how for five years there have been no movements whatsoever. You did briefly uh, address this saying that no one wants to, no country wants to give up their opportunity to have these, but could you give us a bit more concrete and nuanced opinion like what, what's, what's really behind this? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, um Obviously, uh, lethal autonomous weapons would allow us to take human beings off the battlefield. And um, nobody wants to, and there, there is not a single country in the world that wants to continue fighting with people 
if they can take people off the battlefield. So, you know, uh, the, the, so that, that's a given. And my daughter's actually a pilot in the American military. So I don't want her hurt either. So, so I, 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 you know, my instinct as a mother would be, yes, let the plane fly, fly itself. Let the plane return fire, um, especially if she's disabled in some way. But if you think about it in the bigger geopolitical picture, what we what we see what we used to see a lot were proxy wars, um, where um, the superpowers fought their wars in other people's countries. Um, one of the things that helps to stop wars is actually the the level of casualties, particularly amongst the the, the um, the people who are in, sorry, in democratic societies, when you start seeing people from your country coming back in body bags, that's, that's when, we, when you start having the conversation. We saw that in Vietnam, for example. And so, you know, the worry is really that um, if we don't anymore use human beings, those wars could drag on for much, much longer as we use... Yeah. AI-enabled weapons. Okay. Uh, uh, next question will be along the, the lines of this one, but expanding. Uh, what are some points in AI that you personally feel need more attention and consideration in terms of law regulations? Yeah, certainly. That's a great question. And um, I think... So... The way that I see it is um, regulation tends to be problematic because it sort of it it sets it sets a bar and the technology has been run and runs the technology yeah, runs it, so much more quickly. So you know I like the fact that uh, the EU is going to talk about harms rather than uh, rather than about the technology itself. But um, what what do I, uh, what would I regulate? I would actually regulate facial recognition. If I was going to pick one thing, I would regulate the use of facial recognition technology because it can very easily um, become a very pernicious surveillance system. Um, and um, that's not what we want to see. Um, we it would be good not to fall into the system that the we saw prior to the Nazis um, uh, of um, neighbors surveilling neighbors as well. And yeah. so, you know, I would just I would just ban the use of facial recognition technology um, in any in, in every um, public space. Every public um, surveillance space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's also a big problem if you want to protest, you know, if you of want course, to protest, of they can find and, and it's facial recognition technology, but it's also gate gate recognition technology, you know, um, which was used um, in Hong Kong a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah th those are definitely great points. I, I didn't think too much about facial recognition, but uh, yeah, you're you're definitely right. It's one of those. That really need to be carefully considered on how how to approach. Uh, uh, I would also like to take another quote, kind of that you said: um, AI could be the best thing we do, or the last thing we do. Uh, could you kind of give us an inside look on how the ethics committee, uh, excuse me, on how the ethics committees and regulatory bodies are kind of perceiving this statement, if they're actually considering it? as really dangerous or not really a possibility and if they are perceived as dangerous inside of those committees uh, what are some precautions that we can take to prevent that and what what are some suggestions and stuff that yeah society can certainly do? um thank you so so that was a statement in 2014 and we've come a long way in the way that we've been thinking about ai um ever since and um, so 
what Stephen Hawking and Max and, and uh, Stuart Russell were interested in at that stage was what um, we call uh, super intelligence. Um, and so there was a lot in 2014, we were talking a great deal about whether we could, if, if, a, if, we got to super intelligence we could uh, shuttle ju speed. just to clarify do by super intelligence you mean uh general ai like uh ah uh, uh, no i don't actually no? okay <laughs> good, 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 that's why good, good reason for clarifying thank you um so general ai would be where ai can do what we as human beings can do so you know at the moment we have narrow ai where the the machine's really good at doing one, one particular task yeah. really well but as human beings we're able to do lots of things at the same time you know i i can't i i could as a woman be multitasking lots of different things at the same time and i'm using all different pieces of my brain to work work out how to do this so um, that's general intelligence, artificial intelligence. Super intelligence is um, when one machine can manage to do everything better than all of us on the planet, and that or and that was the um, that was one of that was the principal worry that we were talking about in those days. And so Nick Bostrom's book, Super Intelligence, um, suggested that we might be at super intelligence by 2090. But I tend to think that um, any any prediction like that is rather, you know, putting your putting your finger in the air and, yeah. <laughs> and working out. You know, <laughs> anyone anyone can try and guess that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so obviously, you know, the debate at that stage was not nuanced. Um, there were um, a lot of, there was a lot of worry about whether we could switch off a, either a narrow AI or a, a super intelligent AI that had been um, incorrectly given instructions, for example, to create paper clips. Um, and oh, I love that example, be, yeah. Yeah, the, it's, the, it's the common example, it creates paper clips and it uses up all the world's resources creating paper clips because we haven't worked out how to switch it off. Um, since then, um, a, a number of very eminent people have continued to think about that problem as well as the other things that I've been talking about today. Notably, Stuart Russell, who thinks that he may have solved the off, off switch problem. Um, so that would be great. Um, but now, really, the regulation is more about where we're seeing harms coming to um, citizens um, immediately um, from the technology that we have created. For example, the algorithms around hiring, which have, um, which have the ability, and I'm not saying they're all bad because they're not, but they do have the ability to um, discriminate. Yeah, um, pick up biases that we're not aware of. Absolutely. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the answer. I would once again reach out to the audience to see if there are any more questions anyone would like to ask. No? Uh, well, uh, Kay, thank you very much for, for that talk. It was really nice talking to you and these kind of uh, few questions that I have asked. Uh, it feels like a good conversation and I hope... Uh, Hope you had fun and uh, and I hope the audience uh, learned something new today. Well, I hope so too. I hope I didn't blind everybody with, with a new way of thinking about artificial intelligence, but I would like to just, just finish by saying, you know, you don't want to be the company that is creating um, non-responsible AI. And, uh, I, I want to call out, I think, two companies that I know are in the audience or are, have speakers coming. One is IBM um, and another, well, actually more. Uh, I know Microsoft is with you as well. Both of them have worked with us to, um, to show how they think about responsible AI and if you are at the very beginning of this journey, 
They would be great tools to read. You don't have to choose the Microsoft way or the IBM way. You could also choose the Salesforce way, or you could mix and match. So you, you, know, you don't have to spend a lot of money on getting it right because there are now tools available. And I also noticed that, um, and, I, I, and I want to finish on a positive note, mm. I also noticed that the Chief AI Officer of Coach Holdings is with you. And we've been doing some work with them and some and Deloitte and Google, Microsoft, some other big companies and uh, around the world to develop an algorithm that tells us within a 24 hour window when a wildfire is going to occur. So I wanted to finish with a positive use of artificial intelligence because otherwise people just think that I'm the voice of doom all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand how you feel, but yeah, definitely we are all aware how, how AI can actually be used for good and those examples are, are great. Uh, thank you very much, Kay, for joining us and hopefully we will uh, collaborate again on the Data Science Conference. Thank you. It's been my total pleasure. Bye. Bye.